This is my shop. There's a lot of tools in it. And one of the number one questions I've gotten since winning the mid-range nationals is, what tools do you really use when you're reloading? I'm gonna walk you through them right now. So first thing to understand is you're gonna to get to see the brand new F-Class John website. This launched just a couple weeks ago and it has tons of information on it. But one of the tabs that I think is the best is the what do I use tab. Because really at the end of the day, a lot of people wanna know. Now, what I use doesn't make it the best. It doesn't make it the only thing out there. And there are certainly lots of great products that accomplish the same thing. But I'm gonna walk you through the different tools I have, why I like them, why they serve my needs, and then you can make a decision. So let's jump onto the website and let's take a closer look at what I use when I'm actually reloading. This is the F-Class John website. And what you'll see here is the What I Use tab. So let's go ahead and head over there. Now I try to keep this up to date. If I make a change uh, to the product I'm using, I definitely put it in here. There are a couple exceptions to what I use in terms of, you know, like for instance, I use a Sartorius, but my system will work with an A&D or a Creedmoor, and I'll explain about that. But uh, pretty much everything else you see is what I am actually using. Uh, this video is gonna focus on the reloading room, and we're gonna start with my press. Now, my press is a Dillon 750, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you through kind of, you know, some of the websites you can find stuff at. I get a lot of questions about, you know, where do I find it, what does it look like, and, and rather than show you in my shop, I just thought this would be a much better way to do it. This is the Dillon 750. Obviously, they've got it dressed up quite a bit. I do use the auto feeder on it, uh, I don't have the bullet tray or any of this stuff because with the auto drive, I just don't need it. However, I've used these uh, bullet trays and, and pull handles and stuff, and they're very effective. A lot of this just depends on how you're going to set it up. Now, I get a lot of questions. Why, why do you use the 750? Why don't you use you know some of the other presses that you've had? I've had Lee. I've had the Zero Press. I've, um, I've had a, a couple of Forster Coaxes, uh, a couple of 550s. Like, I've gone through a lot of different presses. And to be honest, at this point, I chose the 750, even without the auto drive, just for the ease of use on my hands uh, and my shoulder. I have, um, you know, um, a, a minor torn rotator cuff issue. I've got problems with my hands and I try to eliminate as much uh, pain and suffering as, on my body as I can. And to simplify the process, having the case feeder on the 750 is critical for me. Uh, the truth is, I think the 550 is actually a better press for precision loading because of how the shell plate system works, but it's just not practical uh, in terms of auto indexing, having an auto drive, uh, case feeding. Like they do make a case feeder for the 550, but it's really limited to pistol calibers and, and or pistol cartridges and, you know, a couple like 223 and stuff. So it's just not practical. The 750 meets all of my needs. It has great add-ons that I'll show you later from like Cortina and stuff like that. But I do use the case feeder. I have the, the basic 750. And then I have a couple of other little add-ons that I've done on the 750. But for the most part, it's a pretty simple system that I've just put onto the auto drive. So let's take a look at that. So here is the auto drive. And this is the one for the 650, 750. Now I happen to be doing this during Black Friday time. So they are on sale. Typically they're about 2,300 or so. It comes shipped just like this. And, uh, you know, I, I would love to tell you it's a perfect system and, and you would think for 23 something, it would be a perfect system. It's really close. It does a lot of great things. Uh, but you know, like anything you can kind of wish in one hand and, and, and whatnot. Um, the, the way the cam system, the way it cams over and stuff like that with the 750, it does apply a lot of pressure in ways that you have to get used to. It is different, um, even though it pushes on the ram in, this, in a similar fashion, it is going to apply pressure differently than pulling on a handle. You are not going to have that sensation when things are about to stick or break or crush. Uh, you have to make sure that you monitor all the safety issues. Don't get your fingers in there. Like this thing does not care. It is a ton of uh, cranking power. If you get something in there, it will 100% break it, uh, whether that's your finger, whether that's a tool, anything like that. So you do have to really pay attention. 
at least from my experience, the best thing on the market, especially for larger rifle uh, cartridges. I, I know there's a couple other systems out there that are really great that work really well with pistol and, and smaller rifle, but for the amount of pressure we have to exert on our bases and, and stuff like that, this really is still. It does come with uh, this monitor right here. It's got this stop button and you can get a bunch of different, you know, sensors and accessories for it. Uh, but uh, the ability to get this set up, get it running correctly and walk away, or at least, you know, be able to do something else in your shop while it's running. To me, it's just, it's priceless. Um, the, the ability, you know, I can go out and load 500 round or, you know, process 500 pieces of brass in a day and you know not really feel it so um, that's why i'm a big fan of this uh, then we look at the bullet feeding system i use the mr bullet feeder now this is the gen 2 ah this is the gen 2 and there are a couple things about it right here they did improve the feed ramp on it supposedly this system with the flipping system and the bullet and the feed ramp are all uh much improved over the original which is what i have uh, one this one. However, what I use it for, it works great. Uh, Cortina includes an, an improved feed ramp with his bullet pointing system. So it has everything I need. I don't have the, you know, any compelling reason to upgrade to the Gen 2. But if I was buying a new one, I would 100% leave the Gen 1 in the dust and get a Gen 2. I think this is a very tough system to beat. Uh, this one here, they've added this viewing window so you can see what kind of, you know, how many bullets you have left. There's an, it's an emptying, um, from what I understand this, you can actually empty the bullets out, which is nice. Cause in the gen one, you can't do that. Uh, they've really thought about a lot of great upgrades and who knows, maybe someday, uh, I'll upgrade, but, um, I just don't have a need to be honest. So that is the bullet feeding system. And again, I use that, uh, primarily for feeding my either bullet sorting with, uh, the Cortina die or with the bullet pointing system that Cortina has. Uh, and then you can also use it if you're going to seat bullets on the Dillon as well. People always ask, what tool heads are you using? Well, I've used a company called Arminoff in the past. They're not really making the tool heads anymore. I did like them because they had the built-in, uh, the drilled-in, tapped-in uh, areas for doing a floating, t uh, floating ring. But they're really impossible to find now. So I have actually, I mean, of all places, it's eBay. But this Joffrey USA guy... Uh, he makes solid products. I've bought, I don't know, three or four or five different tool heads from him. Uh, they're all really well made. They're, they're machined nicely. They are priced right for what they are. You can color code them. You can actually get, you know, laser engraved ones. And he does other stuff too that I'll just show you. Like if you want uh, holders for your, um, your stuff, it works. But, uh, you know, I just get the, the tool heads from him and I've been really happy with them. I don't really color code any of my stuff. I just kind of got a rainbow of colors, so it looked pretty. But uh, other than that, um, you know, they, they are, I think, probably, I don't know. I've used, there's, there's other ones on the market that are great. They're just twice, twice as much. Um, these are 100% everything you need, in my opinion. And he does, like, the blackout one. I don't know if he has a picture easily to see here. But he does the blackout versions if you happen to load blackout. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, here you go. So he's got the blackout ones where the die has to sit lower. So they're already machined out and, and stuff like that. So, um, you know, they're good to deal with. I've always gotten everything I've ordered in, in a really quick shipping time. And, um, you know, it's for me, it just works. So uh, there's really not a lot else to say about the Dylan. There's probably some little add-ons here and there that I'll eventually post on on here. But um, I don't know. It's, um, this, this is the, about what you need to get started. As far as the Henderson trimmer goes, I think it is still, uh, my favorite. Now there's, again, there's other great trimmers on the market. They all work a little differently for my hands, speed, consistency right now. This is, uh, want it's very consistent. It makes a great cut with the Forster head that it uses. And you can see, um, uh, this is facing backwards. Let me see if I can find you a better view of the cutting head here. Yeah, so there's the cutting head. So this uses the Forrester system. It's got a little pilot. Um, I've actually played around with uh, making a brush pilot for this, so it brushes the inside of the necks at the same time. It's worked very well for me. Uh, the the 3-in-1 cutter heads can be a little challenging if you, if you screw up adjusting them, so I'd probably recommend leaving them set 
as they come from Henderson, but um, he is really good at helping walk you through how to adjust them if you need to. The only thing I'll say about the, the trimmer is that, um, you know, it, it does add up uh, if you get into, uh, for instance, the, um, uh, I've got this one set to the regular one, but if you go to the uh, powered one, you know, you're going to go up to about 800 bucks and, um, you know, it does get a little pricey, but I think it's worth it for what it does. The other thing in a minute is the auto dod, which also has a trimmer function that I've been playing with and um you know is also a compelling argument for some people who already own an auto dodge so let's go to the amp uh as of right now uh this is still what i am using i've been using one for at least five or six years i had an original uh it wasn't really called a mark one but i had the original amp uh, ultimately upgraded to this one it's got faster better cooling on it and you know all that kind of whiz bang stuff. So I figured why not at the time, uh, they, you know, they are a little pricey at 1400 bucks. And then of course you add on an amp mate and that's going to put another 500 bucks on top of it plus 300 bucks for a case feeder. So, um, you know, for a fully automated version of the amp, you're going to be up in the $2,300 range. So it, it does get a little expensive, um, no doubt, but as a standalone unit, this is perfectly usable and functioning. Uh, it uses these pilots that you can see here and a little case holder so it goes pretty quickly if you're doing them by hand and what's nice is in their latest functioning uh firmware that's been put out it has a thing that will tell you or it has a thing that will automatically start so you don't have to hit the start button anymore you just keep you know putting the brass in and then it keeps annealing and that has for people that don't have an amp mate uh that has you know probably doubled their their speed with this thing so um, you know, I know there are some competitors out there. I haven't tried any of them. I haven't really had a compelling reason to do it, uh, since I've had such good success with the amp, but you never know down the line, I might try something different. The, uh, powder system. Now this gets a little tricky because I am, I, I'm, I'm, I have this listed and this is technically what I used prior to nationals and what I've been using for a while, which is the auto trickler system not a v4 although the v4 is a very good unit on its own what i've been using is a v3 with the ingenuity system and that is looks like this so you've got the v3 here you've got the trickler system here and his trickler system uses uh, a series of plates which uh, i don't think they have a quick video or a quick picture of but the the plates are all sort of powder specific to make sure that a kernel fits in them it is crazy fast and crazy effective with almost no overthrows. Uh, and then I, he, he has a brand new complete powder throwing system that I am beta testing now. And I think that's going to be a complete game changer for the market. I think it's going to be what everybody's been hoping for with some other systems that have come out recently and, and maybe, you know, had some love hate relationships with, I think this new one is going to be uh, I, I, I sort of call it the, the, the Garmin of the powder trickler system. It, I think people are just going to go, okay, this is, this is what powder trickling we've been waiting for. So, uh, we'll see, but, uh, you know, Paul over at ingenuity, uh, makes some really great stuff and, and look, Adam makes great. His V4 is incredibly effective. It's got great software that he, or firmware that he's just upgraded earlier this year. That's really lucky right now to be in such a I mean it's a great time to be reloading with so many options out there and um, you know you just there's a lot of things you can try out there to see what fits your needs now these systems whether it's the auto trickler or the ingenuity typically will work one familiar with now I do have one of these I do use it so I do have it linked here um, you know, these are, you can see here, depending on where you buy them, they're a little over seven. I think if you go to CE products, they're right around 600 and then you pay shipping. And I think they're coming from Canada at that point. Um, so some people just prefer to pay a little more and have it in the U.S. versus coming from Canada. But whatever the case is, the FX is the standard choice, especially for auto trickler. It's the only choice. However, the new Ingenuity system, without buying any new hardware, will automatically switch between the Sartorius, the a and and the Creedmoor. So the um, Sartorius is what I'm currently using. So I'm using an older version of this Entrust 2 system 
Uh, I'm using the Entrus 1, I think it is. And, and you can see there's different Sartorius scales. They all have slightly different um, uh, you know, parameters, but they all work on essentially the same system that this system will work on. And then the Creedmoor scale is really kind of the, I don't know, some people call it the dark horse in the reloading scale business. I've, re I've, I've used one, um, I reviewed one several years ago when it first came out, and I thought it was a great scale. It just, at the time, wouldn't hook up to an automatic system. However, the new Ingenuity system will plug right into it, and his testing uh, has shown that it is a very reliable, very stable, accurate scale. It's just slower. So whereas with the Sartorius and his new system, I can get about seven, eight second throws with zero, zero issues at about 60 grains, uh, the Creedmoor is probably going to run you closer to 15, 18 seconds. So, you know, a little over twice as, as slow. But for a lot of people, that doesn't matter, especially with such a great price point. So this is a wonderful way to go. And I think a lot of people will be really happy with that. Let's get into the dies. Uh, so the dies, I, I have a variety of dies that I use. Some are going to be on the Dillon. Some are going to be standalone, like seating dies. And I'll kind of explain what we've got. So the, the first thing of note would be the sizing die from Cortina. This is what I'm using. Uh, I really like the fact that he has this graduated top on it and there is right here you can see on the die itself there's an indicating line and so you can set up this die either like to basically oversize uh, you know or over bump your shoulders and then back it off and each of these is a one thousandths increment or some people will set it up so they can go deeper or shallower with a turn of uh, the cap here now um, it's simple. It's effective. It does have a decapper built into it. There's no shims. And another nice thing about the way his system works is that it uses an all-in-one. So in here is going to be the bushing. And the bushing is both a bushing and the shoulder bump all built into one. So if you have something like 6.5 PRC and maybe you have a hunting gun in actual 6.5 PRC, but then you have a competition gun in, you know, 6.5 PRC necked up to seven, you can use the same die, you just swap out the bushings because the neck diameter and the shoulder are all built into the um, into that bushing. So it, it does definitely make a difference uh, in terms of cost because you can then use it for multiple cartridges. Not every cartridge is going to be that way, but uh, he does make them in quite a few of the popular cartridge sizes here. And I know that as things come on online, he is definitely looking at expanding. So that is what I'm using for a sizing die. Then uh, I'm gonna skip down here. Uh, I'll get to the bullet sorting in a minute, but I am using his mandrel die. And you can see his mandrel die is just a straight body, but it does have the kind of lower, the reason I really like this is because the bottom, I think it's like the bottom third of the die has the same dimensions as the full length sizing die. So. It's not really a small base die per se, but it does give you a little additional bump to help uh, curb any kind of clickers or anything like that. And especially in something like our good old, you know, seven brass, it's a thick base. It can get to clickers pretty quickly depending on your chamber dimensions. Having this extra little oomph at the bottom really helps bring your brass back into line every time you're sizing. Also, his mandrels are really well coated. I mean, I, I don't even lube when I neck up, and I've had zero issues necking up my 6.5 to 7 mil uh, with his mandrels. And the mandrels will also uh, interchange with his brush. Uh, he's got a brush insert that screws into the top right here, and then you can brush the inside of the necks as well. So they're very, very multi-purpose. Uh, he does offer them, again, in most of the popular competition cartridges, which I think is great. Uh, then we get to the bullet sorting system. So, actually, I probably should start with the bullet flow system because the, the sorting system sort of builds on that. But you have this bullet feeding, uh, bullet uh, system, and these are the dies. If we go to the actual bullet processing here, you can see that it comes with a shell plate where the bullet will sit. Then you have the, um, this is the feeder die that will feed onto the shell plate. And then you have 
the actual extracting die. So uh, from your from either a tube or the Mr. Bullet Feeder, it will come in on here. It'll go onto the shell plate and then they go up and out of the extraction system. And then somewhere in between, you are either going to put a pointing die such as uh, what I have here, which is the Accuracy 1. So you can see right here, this is the Accuracy 1 pointing die. And, um, you know, that's going to let you bring it right back out. Cortina offers, which is, sorry, these zoomed in things. Um, this is going to go in between. So bullet comes in, then it's going to go into this sorting die either as it's coming down or if you can get in the right rhythm with it going through the extraction die you can do that as well but this is a great way to load up a bunch of bullets sort them very quick uh, for overall length and then put them back into the same system with the pointing die and you're good to go the nice thing is when you have this sorting die set up you can actually just remove the indicator if you want uh, or just back this die off uh, and in fact, you don't even have to do any of that. Like you could just leave this in and and still run the dies through the pointer. So the, the pointing die when you're sorting, if, if you have it all set up and you don't want to move anything, then you would just remove the bullet as it's coming down out of the sorting die before it gets to the pointing die next. Or you could back out your pointing die so that um, nothing's being affected there. But lots of great options for bullet management on a 750, which again is one of the reasons I love the 750. When it comes to actual seating, I am currently seating on an Arbor Press. Now I've seated on my 750 in the past. Uh, I actually have a die that I use. It's just a custom Newland that somebody made for me, but I don't really use it anymore. I don't seat on my Dillon uh, and I used to seat long. And then when I went to a match or whatever, I would just use my Arbor Press. Honestly, I've, I've with dropping powder and stuff, I I kind of like using the Arbor Press and, and just getting it done and, and, you know, you're good to go. So when I'm at home, I use the Short Action Customs die. Now, I, I really like this Infinity die for a, a couple reasons. Oh, hang on. It's thinking. Some of these websites are a little overloaded right now because it's close to Black Friday. But uh, what I really like about this is it's a multi kind of multi-part system. So if you only use this and you do a bunch of different cartridges, you can get different stems, different pushers, different bases, and you can do a lot of different things with one die. Uh, for me, I really like these bases that are here because they are really stable. And, uh, you know, I've, I've got slightly shaky hands and I have I've especially lately been dropping things more. And I find that when I put a bullet in, um, again, their website's really not reacting well, so I apologize, but, um, I don't know if this is going to reset it, but anyway, you can see right here, there's a bullet in, in the base and these are really hard to knock over compared to just setting a bullet underneath or like on an Arbor, uh, stand and then, and then, um, you know, putting the die over it. So, uh, I really like it. It's click adjustable. It has a zero reset. If I need to do like a seating depth test, it's super quick and simple. Uh, but really great set of dies. Um, I've had just no issues with those whatsoever. And then for traveling, I really like the F-Class products. Now, you know, it's it's a choice that I make in terms of having two sets of dies. And, you know, that's just the way it goes. But these are really nice, small, compact, but super effective dies. They have a, a micro click adjustment inside of them. Uh, they, they don't take up a lot of space in my travel bag and I just really, really like them for that purpose. But because they are lighter, smaller, and because I'm a little clumsier around the shop lately, um, I have found that I, I, you know, like if I don't get the, the brass lined up underneath it, I have knocked over a couple. And so that's why I like using the short actions at home, but 100%, this thing's like nine ounces lighter. I mean, a half a pound lighter than the short action. And, you know, that, that makes a difference when I'm traveling. So uh, because my bullets are already seated when I travel, I'm just seating them long. I don't have to worry about, you know, if I drop a bullet or something, it's not the end of the world. I can, I, you know, I can load it up. But uh, both make great dies. If you're only to use one of them, 
uh, at home, either one would probably make you happy. The difference obviously being that with the uh, F-Class products ones, they are cartridge specific. With the short action customs, you have a lot of uh, different options uh, in one die that you can make. Decapping. So I use two different decappers. I use this, which is the FW Arms uh, decapper popper. And this has a large spring built into it. And um, what it does is it's going to So that's your decapper and then your brass sort of self centers in here. And that's going to really help make sure that this lines up with your flash hole. I really like this because it just gives me that that positive kind of a slam pop every time it's decapping. And uh, that's, you know, that's important to me. Now, I do also have the standard decapper. And this one I have set up in a different tool head simply because uh, I use this just after I've tumbled to get out any media from the flash hole. It's just simple and inexpensive. There's no need to have a second popper. And I don't want to, I don't want to use the tool head that I have that popper on uh, just for clearing out uh, brass because this is actually on a die that has an expander mandrel or on a tool head that has an expander mandrel. So it's part of another tool head. So I just, it's inexpensive, but it's really effective. These pins like FW Arms makes just rock solid decappers. I have yet to even remotely come close to breaking one. And uh, the guy's just really great to deal with. So that's, um, that's what I use there. Let's get into the auto dod. Now, this is a fairly new, um, new thing for me. Uh, I just got this maybe, I don't know, six months ago, something like that. And when I had my 284, I, I refused to turn necks. I hate turning necks. It's hard on my hands. I've, I've used a number of the tools out there and, and they all do a great job. It's not a, an efficacy issue. It's just a, you know, for lack of a better word, pain in the ass issue. So when I got the PRCW, it just really became apparent that getting every ounce of accuracy out of it, um, it was, it was easier when you did every step. And so, uh, the, the turning of the necks is something that I just found I really needed to get back into. So I went with the auto dod and it is wonderful to use. Uh, it's expensive. Sure. But, uh, the ability to put in a case, you hit this little button, it does its thing. You're done. It whacks it out. And then ultimately sometime in the next few months here, he's going to have an auto feed system for this so that I don't even have to touch it. You just drop in the brass in a case feeder and just like on my amp or on my Dylan, it is on its own. Here's where the real beauty of this comes in. And I don't know. So if you look here, you can see this little notch in his, this is basically a boring bar and that's what cuts the inside of the neck. And that little notch right there is actually for trimming, chamfering, and deburring. And I've been playing with this, and it's it's actually uh, pretty effective. Now, it's not going to give you those long, beautiful VLD cuts that, like the Henderson will or Gerode, but it's very effective. And one system, this is you know so far trimming is the only process you can't automate until now. Uh, on top of that, he's going to have a different kind of bullet trimming system. Uh, there's other things that he's looking at doing. So when you look at it that way, the auto dot is really uh, going to become more of a tool system that really helps drive the price down mentally for a lot of people. Because if you can eliminate a $500, $800 trimmer, now, you know, that takes that price off of the auto dot. If I can trim bullets, boom, that's, you know, dies or something that I don't have to buy. So, you know, there's, there's different ways to approach reloading. This is one of the ways. And for some people, it's going to work really well. Um, some people, you know, they may not like the way that it works and that's fine too. Brass cleaning. Um, as you know, I've used, uh, pretty much every kind of brass cleaning system out there. They all clean brass. I mean, they do it differently. Obviously wet tumbling does differently than ultrasonic, which is different than dry tumbling in media. Uh, I will just say that again, in dealing with, uh, uh, weight and my hands and my shoulder and different things like that. I have just found that vibratory cleaning has been super effective for me. I do, I do say I, even when I had a, 
large wet tumbler. I was still using media in it and dry tumbling just because I like leaving the carbon inside. I use the Ultra Vibe cleaner. I don't think they actually make it. I have yet to find a link to somewhere that actually has it for sale. So I think it's been discontinued some time ago. But any good vibratory cleaner, whether it's the Dillon or Frankfurt Arsenal or you know any of those are going to work fine. Uh, but since this is what I use, that's what I've listed. And then the Frankfurt Arsenal brass separator is, is really a pretty nice system in general for separating brass for no other reason than it's got this lid that goes over so you're not spilling brass everywhere. Uh, it is not quite as roomy as the Dillon, which I, I technically still have the Dillon too. Um, but I do like the fact that this cover uh, helps keep everything locked in there. So, uh, you know, it just sort of depends what you're up for. If, if you want something that's a little roomier and, you know, probably a little more robust, the Dillon is a little better. If you are doing smaller batches and you don't want media flying around in a, in a you know, inside bedroom or something, if you're loading, uh, this cover makes it really nice. So that's, uh, that's what I got there. Uh, people always ask, what do you tumble with? Well, I tumble with rice. Uh, I get buy whatever's the cheapest thing in a 20 or 25 pound bag. Uh, rice starts out white and as you use it more, it's going to turn kind of a charcoal gray to black. I typically will swap it out when it's kind of a dark gray. And in most cases, that's somewhere between 500 and a thousand pieces, depending on how dirty everything is. So we've got all of that. As far as using the inline dies we talked about, so we talked about the F-Class products and the Short Action Customs dies. Uh, I am using the K&M Arbor die uh, press, which is this one here. I do have a force pack. I'll be honest, I don't use the force pack all that often. It is nice when I need to measure something or see you know, if I've changed a process, but I just don't really uh, find a need with that. He does make a nice travel kit. If you do want to travel, it comes in a nice little hard case and it's all punched out for the press and stuff. Uh, but here is the reasoning that I have gone back to um, using the K&M. So the K&M is the first Arbor Press that I ever used. Uh, it's also the first Arbor Press I sold and then bought another brand and then another brand and another brand. And I've been through probably five different Arbor Presses and I am now back and I honestly, I won't switch at this point. And, and here's the reasons why. One, it's just really simple to use, but that can be said of a lot of Arbor presses. What really makes the K&M different, and it's sort of hard to see in this picture here. Let me see if, um, if I can find a better photo here. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so if you look, you can see this whole blue block on the other side, there's a little slot right there, but this whole blue side, from, from these two screws is clamping onto this rail. And this is a flat, it's sort of, think of it as a Picatinny rail without the grooves in it. It is a tapered backside. And there's no way for this to twist or rotate. Now, every other Arbor Press that I've ever used is on a round pole. Um, and my experience is that for whatever reason, they move. Either this will twist sideways or it'll, it'll slide up and down. You're constantly like you really have to torque those things onto the pole in order to not get any movement and that also goes for moving this piece on the base so i had one arbor press and this stayed put but then this thing would constantly rotate and again i take my arbor presses apart and put them together a lot when i'm traveling so in terms of pure like wear tear know it's going to always work and I'm not going to get frustrated. The K&M is 100% my favorite. The fact that you can add a force pack is an added benefit because there are times that you want to be able to measure what is going on for travel. It just doesn't, it's just not make sense for me. So that is uh, my choice for an Arbor Press and that's why I use that one. We'll get into some other, just a couple of odds and ends around the shop. So as far as si uh, sizing lube goes, I've, I've never shied away from the fact that I use one shot when used properly. I've had no issues with this. Uh, are there probably better lubes out there? Yeah. I mean, if you use some of the, uh, you know, the, the wipe on lubes, uh, they probably are a little bit more effective. I won't lie. I mean, it's just more time consuming and especially on, on something like an auto drive, it just doesn't make sense to sit there and load everything up with, you know, finger lube and then this and that. I do like that the one shot dries, uh, you know, pretty well. It doesn't really get sticky. 
It comes off in my Tumblr real well. Just a lot of things about it. I've done videos on how to apply this. I just use a big plastic bag. I put my 100 pieces of brass in there. I spray, I shake, I spray, I shake a couple times. The one thing to know about one shot, the biggest things that will get people stuck with one shot is they will have used something like a lanolin uh, lube in their dyes. And then somebody tells them to try one shot. They put it on their brass and then they lock one up in the dye. And that is 100% true. One shot does not interact well with other lubes. So if you're going to try one shot, you need to completely degrease and clean out whatever sizing dye you're using. And then I usually take a little bore mop, like a 20 gauge bore mop, spray it with one shot, take a couple slides up and down inside the dye, then get my, my brass going and then that will lead to happy sizing. For an ammo block on my bench, I've used quite a few. I still like the Big Dog Steel here. This is a 3D printed, but it is, I mean, it's off a very expensive 3D printer. In fact, it's almost impossible to tell that it's 3D printed. That's how well it's done. But they're light. It's weird. They're not too light, but it's, you know, it's, it's comfortable to use, but solid enough that it's not going to, you know, fly around on your bench. He does a really nice big bullet tray, which I never used to use bullet trays until I started using his. But I really like it. You can add on easily. Flips over and does 223. The Magnum just does Magnum, but to be expected. Uh, I use the Short Action Customs Modular Funnel. And here's why I've, I've had another funnel that I've used most of my reloading career and it's worked fine. However, somebody told me about this one. I gave it a try and it 100% does things differently because you see these little, these little scallops right here. Well, those scallops, if you look carefully, they are going to break up the powder. So instead of a round hole, which can bridge, this actually helps diffuse the powder down into the powder tube. Obviously these little cutouts will help uh, break up some clumps as well, but really this, when, when the powder hits it, it, it does a great job of getting everything done. Uh, the only thing I will say that I've added, and I'll, I'll just see here if I can find it. So in the top here, I did take, I think it's a one and a half inch PVC ABS coupler that I put in here to help kind of make a, a tall uh, feeder, if you will, so that I can just dump uh, powder pretty quickly without it flying out. And that's just a personal preference thing. And then on the bottom here, this is set up so that you can use the same modular insert that you would use in their uh, comparator kit. So you just buy the, let's say it's a seven mil, 30 degree shoulder. You can pop it in here. And then when you're done loading, pop it out, put it into your caliper comparator. So again, they are all about helping reduce uh, needless tools by using parts on multiple tools, which I think is, is really a, a cool way to go. They also make an extension that's, that pops right into uh, here as well. So you can go one and a half, three. Uh, so they're one and a half extensions or one inch extensions. I don't, I don't remember, but it's either one or one and a half inch long extension. So you can make whatever length tube that you like. So I, I'm a big fan of those. I also use the Shroud Action Customs comparators. So again, these are the bodies and then there are the inserts that'll pop right into it. And these are the modular inserts. So you can see they come in all different cartridges and uh, tapers. And these can be used, again, in the powder dispenser. They can be used in the comparators. Uh, they're multifunction, which is, uh, it, it makes for a, a good product there. On the bench, I use the modular action wrench, and, and here's why. Uh, you only need one action wrench for pretty much anything you're ever gonna buy for a rifle because this little head right here, uh, and again, they're just probably bogged down with traffic right now, but this little head right here is replaceable. There's about seven or eight different uh, heads, and you can go from a Tika to a Bat to a Borden to a Rimrock, uh, standard Remington, Tika, like whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, they'll have a head for it. And then that way you only have one shaft and a bunch of heads. Life's easy. It works fantastic. 
It's undersized, so it fits pretty much any action that you can think of. And uh, it's, it's just nice only having one action wrench because if you're into swapping out barrels or replacing barrels and you have multiple actions, you probably have two, three, four different action wrenches sitting in your drawers. Uh, this does remove all of that. Then we have the barrel vise. This again has made life so easy for me because uh, you know I deal with a lot of different barrel diameters. You just plop in whatever uh, shim that you need for the barrel diameter. You clamp it down. You're good to go. It's I mean you really can't uh, uh, you can't make things any easier. And once you have the kit, I mean it goes all the way from like eight yeah eight six five is the smallest all the way up to one two five. So then you're not, you know, like I've done all kinds of things to try to shim smaller barrels on a regular barrel vise, and uh, it, it gets frustrating. They also make a couple other uh, vices, which let me just show you real quick here. So they do make a couple other barrel vices which use the inserts. So you can get something that's less expensive. This is more of a traditional, and they actually say this is better if you really need clamping force than the modular, although I've never had a problem with this one. Uh, this double screw system with the with the inserts uh, is what they say they use in the shop all the time. The other nice thing is because of the uh, the barrel vise kit and on the barrel vise Bravo kit, this plate has an Arca rail system built in. So this or this will slide into the Arca rail, or like my uh, my NRL 22 gun has an Arca rail on the bottom. I can literally clamp the gun into the rail instead of holding it by the barrel. Uh, if I need to work on the gun, um, obviously with things that don't require torque that would rip the rail off, but um, you know anything within reason, uh, you can clamp down uh, to the arc rail. So different ways to go. They do offer, like I said, a, a couple different kinds of uh, clamping systems, and they all work really, really well. So let's then K and M. I use their K and M case holder for on the bench. And this is just something that lets me give my hands a little bit of a break. It is bigger in diameter, you can see here, than holding the brass, so you're not getting any kind of cramping. If you have arthritis or uh, carpal tunnel, things like that, it's very quick to clamp it down around the brass. You can either have it where the head or the base is uh, sticking out. So if you need to do mouth work, you can do something like this here, where the mouth is sticking out or if you need to, obviously, you can have the back sticking out, which is what I typically do for uniforming primer pockets. They have different collets that you can get for all different sized cartridges. And again, it's just an easy way, um, easy way to go. The bench prep tool, this is something, I actually won this. So uh, this, this was at Southwest Nationals. I got it off the raffle table and I, I knew what it was, but I wasn't sure how much I was going to actually enjoy using it. Uh, this thing has become one of my favorite little tools on the bench, and this gives the best view of it. So it's got a collet system here. You can lock it down and, and then, you know, tighten or loosen the collet. But it is whisper quiet. It has a variable RPM here. This little iPod looking thing is the on off switch. And then um, flipping, uh, flipping this uh, will, or ro rolling this will change your RPMs. And I do, my primary thing with it would be uniforming primer pockets. Uh, however, I have clamped everything in here from uh, a full drill chuck and used it for cleaning out different things uh, with a drill bit. I've used it for inside reaming necks. I've used it for putting different brushes on. It, it really is multi, multi-purpose. And I've had people offer to buy it like, hey, we know you always sell stuff. Uh, when you're ready to sell that, let me know. I really, uh, honestly, I thought it was going to be one of those things where I was like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll sell it. Uh, it's clamped down. I mean, it's, it's screwed down to my, my bench and it's not coming off because you never know when you're going to need to use something like this. And I love having it available. The primer pocket uniformer that I am using is this one, which is this carbide three in one. It's really unique because you can see here, I'll zoom in. Uh, it has not only the uh, wall and the face, but also this little uh, dimple here, which is going to chamfer the flash hole. So it, it does three processes at once. I've been using the K&M uh, adjustable carbide uh, flash hole tool for years, and it's basically an end mill. So it just does the face of the primer pocket and the walls, 
But I will say this one, the way they designed it, it feeds cleaner for me, at least I think it does. And uh, I don't end up with as much chattering on the walls, like getting stuck or anything like that. And I really like the way it chamfers it. Now I only do this once. Uh, I, I basically uniform brass when it's virgin, and then that's the last time I touch it. I don't use this tool to clean uh, or, or cut additional material. I just, you know, I tumble and, and clean out the primer pockets. And, and that's all I need to do. But I do love uh, doing this process once on the virgin brass. So that's, that's where I'm at with that one. So that's where we're at. Uh, that is what I use in my shop on a regular basis. And I'm sure there's things I've missed, little things. Maybe you've seen them in a video or things that you have questions about whether I actually use it. Maybe it's a tool that uh, I don't use, but you think I should. You know, feel free to leave something in the comments below. I'm happy to answer it. If it's a tool that I do use and I've forgotten to put it up here for some reason, I'm happy to add to this. The only thing that I will say I don't have on here right now that I am still using is going to be the uh, Harvey, uh, Harvey decapper. And um, let me uh, pull it up here. So, so this is the Harvey D primer. And, you know, it's about 70 bucks. It's not a cheap tool, but it is 100% invaluable for me because I just leave it, you know, in the first drawer of my bench. And anytime I need to pop a primer out, maybe a primer got stuck in there wrong, upside down, uh, you know, something's really stuck in the flash hole that, that you know, I want to look at, I can just grab this, pop it out, and I'm good to go. Now, that's also because I'm running the 750 with the auto drive. It is not easy to just throw a single piece of brass in and use a decapper like if I had for instance, you know, like my Zero Press or a Forster Coax or something like that, where, you know, you can just throw in a decapper and knock it out. So your needs may vary, but if you run an auto drive and it's not, you know, easily accessible, even if you run a 750 and, you know, you don't feel like swapping out your tool heads just to pop a primer, uh, this tool is 100% fantastic for you. So there you go. That is everything in my shop. I hope this helps answer a lot of those questions. And, you know, I, I'm super transparent about what I really use. I don't try to make any, you know, bones about it. And, and when I switch something, I talk about it. Um, I do like to try new equipment, obviously. Otherwise, I wouldn't have this channel. But uh, you want to know what I use? This was it. So I appreciate everybody watching as always. I hope everybody has a good one. And we'll talk later.